The Incom T-65 X-Wing is the iconic fighter for the Rebel Alliance. This is the fighter that took out the Death Star piloted by Luke Skywalker. It is in most respects superior to the Empire's dreaded TIE Fighter, specifically the numerous TIE line series. Unlike TIE Fighters, it is equipped with shields and a hyperdrive, which means it could strike at targets at a longer range without as much need for a carrier of some sort. It had relatively good firepower in its four laser cannons, good sublight speed, and armed with two launchers usually configured to fire proton torpedoes. It's not a single technology that makes the X-Wing good, but a combination of tech such as the continued miniaturization of hyperdrives, life support, and other systems, advances in targeting computers, and the integration of the astromech droids, usually an R2 unit, which can store several hyperdrive jump calculations, make minor repairs while in the heat of battle, and more. But it was not a foregone conclusion that the Rebels would be able to use this amazing fighter at all. Incom, the corporation that invented the X-Wing, along with many other fighters and vehicles, was just a few days from being nationalized by the Galactic Empire. The Incom engineers, growing more and more unhappy with the Imperial rule, decided that they wanted to defect to the Rebels, and helped the Rebels to take four X-Wing prototypes just before the Empire arrived at Frasia to take over. If this had not happened, the Rebels would not have gotten the X-Wing. They would have had to settle for something else, probably something far less effective for their space superiority fighter, and they may have lost the Galactic Civil War entirely. Furthermore, the Empire would have integrated the X-Wing into its already impressive fighter options. This last point is one of contention among the hardcore Star Wars geeks. Some argue that the X-Wing does not fit into the Imperial Doctrine, and this is not entirely wrong, but a rather simplistic summation. But before we get into that, yes, this video has a sponsor. Now if you want to keep your Starfighter blueprints, Death Star plans, or other sensitive information from falling into the wrong hands, I recommend NordVPN. Now in all seriousness, NordVPN is just about as solid as you can get when it comes to protecting your own internet use while allowing you the freedom you deserve for global online usage. Isn't it annoying when certain giant online streaming conglomerates restrict access to what you can watch simply because you reside in a certain country? Well, NordVPN can change that for you, and it's really easy with just one click to open the map, designate an access location from global options, and access content from virtually anywhere. Unfortunately, the same applies to games. I once tried to gift a game to a friend in another country, but I couldn't even get him a gift card because of arbitrary restrictions. Again, NordVPN could get you around this with 59 countries to choose from. So how do you get it? You can get it through the link in the video description below. In fact, through my special link, you can get a two years plan with four months free with a huge discount. Now this is totally risk free with a 30 day money back guarantee. So click that link space friends. And now back to the use of the Imperial X-Wing. Had the Empire acquired the technology to build X-Wings, and actually had the will to use them, they would have certainly been more effective in their war. When talking about the doctrine of the Empire's fighter arsenal, what does this consist of? Remember that after the Clone Wars, the Galactic Republic transforms into the Galactic Empire, and along with it the entire military. Why the Empire saw a need to make this transformation during peacetime is not known, but they clearly wanted all capital ships that were in the least bit capable of carrying starfighters to always have them available. You might say their doctrine is capital ship focused, and capital ships work best with many fighters. This means the Empire needs many inexpensive but still minimally effective fighters, cheaper but comparable in performance to the V-Wings that the Galactic Republic used. Cyanar Fleet Systems, another nationalized fighter manufacturer, designed and built the TIE LN fighter, and the TIE bomber, and later the TIE interceptor. The TIE fighter has no shielding, no onboard life support, and no hyperdrive. As Obi-Wan once pointed out, it's a short-range fighter, totally reliant on a mothership of some kind. Compared to the older V-Wing, the TIE LN is faster and more maneuverable, but V-Wings did have shields, life support, an astromech, and if docked with a hyperdrive ring, it could be capable of hyperdrive. 
But the cost of a new V-Wing is estimated at around 102,000 credits compared to 60,000 credits for the TIE LN. Considering this, probably many more TIEs could be built compared to the Republic designs. Now there is a disadvantage to this doctrine. I would challenge the idea that this is a more cost effective use of fighters for the fleet. For one thing, TIE LNs are not a forgiving ship, more of them will be lost in action. The other thing to consider is that they require a support ship to be deployed at any significant range. And how much does that cost? Let's assume there is a hot spot out there somewhere that requires a response. Perhaps a, perhaps a freighter convoy is under attack by a squadron of Y-Wings that the rebels are using in a hit and run attack. This is something a Star Destroyer cannot be bothered with, but to force off the Y-Wings, fighters will be required. TIE fighters could deal with this nicely. Instead of a Star Destroyer or other capital ship, a Gozanti assault carrier can carry four TIE fighters. This use of the Gazanti is demonstrated well in the game Star Wars Squadrons. It is just about the smallest type of support ship that could carry TIE fighters. The exact dimensions of the Gazanti is somewhat lacking for information, but they appear to be somewhere in the 100 meter range. Perhaps an Imperial Star Destroyer kept about four of these in its hangar, so that's a total of about 16 TIEs a Star Destroyer could deploy for long range operations using those Gazantis. The cost? Wikipedia doesn't have these numbers, but let's assume it's about half the cost of an old Corellian gunship, which seems fair, which would put them around 2.5 million credits. So then, given the cost of a single TIE fighter at 60,000 credits, the total cost for the ability to respond to this raid can be calculated by adding the cost of the four TIEs to the Gazanti carrier, and for comparisons, we'll divide it by four for each TIE fighter, which comes to 685,000 credits per TIE Fighter. Now, compare this to the price of a T-65B X-Wing, which is only 150,000, and can respond to this threat immediately without the support ship. It can also do so much more than a TIE Fighter, and it is far more likely to survive the encounter. Consider that the local Star Destroyer may only have a handful of Gazantis at its disposal whereas it could easily carry two or three squadrons of X-Wings in addition to a number of TIE Fighters. Rapid response is something X-Wings would have found a worthy role in Imperial Doctrine. In fact, this was a weakness the Rebels exploited without mercy. The Empire never really was able to find a real solution to this. They eventually began using assault gunboats, although this was not quite a space superiority fighter. They settled for building more capital ships and carrier types, in the current canon, Grand Admiral Thrawn offered the solution in the TIE Defender, which is superior to the X-Wing. In Legends canon, the Empire does develop the TIE Defender, and according to the X-Wing games, they built and deployed Nebulon B frigates carrying squadrons of TIE fighters to deal with the numerous rebel hit and runs. All of these efforts proved ineffective, and I have some theories about this. In my opinion, just one or two squadrons of X-Wings on every Star Destroyer or major capital ship would have been a nice, neat solution to the Empire's rapid response problem. In sectors where the systems are spread out, a Star Destroyer or other capital ship, mostly with X-Wings, would have been a great solution. Planetary defenses could also greatly benefit from X-Wings, which would not require a carrier or a capital ship to patrol the entire system or group of systems. Of course, the problem is that most Imperial commanders are linear thinkers. They would have to adapt to a more flexible mindset, one that is not so capital ship focused, to successfully use X-Wings. Beyond strategy, tactics, and doctrine, an argument could be made that the integration of X-Wings into the Imperial fleet is kind of a cultural problem. For one thing, imagine the rivalry between TIE fighter pilots and X-Wing jockeys. I'm sure this would have been highly competitive. The other issue is the corruption and corporate favoritism to Sinar fleet systems. Sinar would not care how many TIE fighters or pilots the Empire loses. As long as they keep ordering them, the Sinar family dynasty can continue to profit. Sinar would lobby, backroom deal, and corrupt Imperial officials to make sure they had as little competition as possible. And of course, there is the emphasis on building Death Stars something that would sap the budget of many other Imperial Fleet programs and overall affect the quality of the Imperial Fleet. 
This leads to another question, and that is, without the use of X-Wings, what would the Rebel Alliance have used instead? And I'm afraid that's going to have to be a topic for another video. Until next time, space friends.